Time to start church. Come on up, Richard. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn it over to Lenny, and he's going to uh, lead us in, on, in the opening worship. Amen. Why don't we all stand and sing together in the secret place? today, so we're going to kind of push through them as quick as possible. Uh, first one is uh, those cards that are in, uh, in the chairs in front of you. If you have anything you need to share um, with me, 
uh, use those and then put them in the offering plate uh, when the uh, basket, when it comes around, or hand them to me after the service, um, whatever works for you. Uh, then the next one is uh, we are beginning today our uh, Christmas shoebox. Um, and last year our goal was 75 and we hit 100. So to, uh, this year we're setting our goal at 100 and see what God's going to do. Uh, we've already got uh, six of them done. Uh, we have boxes back there. Uh, if you want to take boxes to fill, um, there are some uh, brochures that, that are really there right now only for demonstration. I've got more that's coming in the mail that should be here in a week or so. So uh, you can look at those. If you've never done a shoebox before, uh, take a look at them. And um, we, uh, we will also have a packing party, I think November 20th, I think is the packing party, if I'm not mistaken. It's about seven weeks from today. So uh, we will be working on that. But to kind of get us in the mood, um, we have a, a video, uh, kind of an overview for this year. When children open their boxes, you can hear the laughter, the cheer. Each gift brings a joy to their heart. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I want the children to know that Jesus Christ is alive and he'll come into each and every heart that invites him. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to share the gospel with children around the world. Every shoebox gift is delivered with a verbal and written proclamation of the gospel in more than a hundred countries every year. This is an evangelism project and it all starts with a very simple shoebox gift. Volunteers are really the heart of who we are and what we do. When we pack the boxes, it's a reflection, a little glimpse of God's love that we're pouring out. When you pack the box, pray. We never know how God is going to use that box. They go by plane, they go by riverboat, they go by motorbikes. These shoe boxes go to children in some of the most isolated areas of the world. Your shoe box goes from you filling it full of toys to all ends of the earth to share the name of Jesus Christ. This box gives us a chance to show them that there is a light, there is a truth. After receiving shoe box gifts, children are invited to a 12 lesson discipleship program, The Greatest Journey. The child is discipled, not only know God, but make God known to others. They started to know the power of prayer. They want to know more. From this, we are seeing lives transformed for the kingdom of God. When I was 14 years old, I started teaching my first The Greatest Journey lesson. If I share the gospel to them, I really, really hope that they share the gospel with everyone they know. The heart of Operation Christmas Child is evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. Because we bring gift to the children, the mothers and the fathers accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. In every church, we are teaching them how to reach out to their neighbors. 
Operation Crystal Shout became the answer from God. Children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And it's time for us to go where no one else went, so the gospel can cover this earth just the way the water covered the ocean. Let's pray for the outreach to continue. It has to be our burden to reach them with the gospel. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. So we need you to keep packing those boxes and continue to pray for the children around the world as we begin to disciple them. God bless you. Thank you. We do the shoe boxes because it's cool for the kids to get presents and know that they're loved. But the real reason that we do it is so that they get the chance to hear the message uh, of the gospel. And uh, I just I want some I got some statistics here. I went to a, a meeting um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the goal for this region, uh, which is Napa, Sonoma, and Marin County, is 5,800 shoe boxes this year. Since 1993, more than 220 million children in over 170 countries and territories have received a shoebox. Shoebox uh, gifts are collected in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Spain, Finland, uh, um, Australia, New Zealand, and South Korea. In, 19, or in 2023, uh, nearly 11.3 million shoeboxes were collected over 10 million from the U.S. alone. Last year, more than 84,000 churches collected shoebox gifts. Our goal, the goal that they have for this year is 12 million shoeboxes uh, uh, collected globally with 10.6 million of those from the U.S. They are celebrating over 50 million children have been discipled through the greatest journey. 50 million kids have heard, heard the, uh, the gospel. And since 2009, over 1.9 million teachers have been trained to lead more than 40, 40.5 million boys and girls who have enrolled in The Greatest Journey. And then more than uh, 20.3 million participants have made decisions for Christ. 20.3 million because of shoeboxes. So anyway, uh, when we were collecting these shoeboxes, it's fun and it's exciting to know that the kids are going to get these but it's much more much more than just uh, a gift in a shoe box it's a chance for them to hear about jesus uh, so let's go to our next one here dear ah we're also starting our gospel mission collection uh, for the great thanksgiving banquet uh, every year we do cans of uh, green beans and, and corn uh, and this year when they called me up, he said, I'm really sorry, before we even opened up for signups, uh, a church uh, took all of them. Uh, so uh, one church uh, is gonna be doing 2,800 cans of, um, of green beans and, and corn. So this year, he sent me a list. So this year, we are gonna collect um, turkey gravy packets. And so they, they look like that. Uh, right now at Walmart, you can get the Swanson ones for $1.22 each uh, and the uh, Great Value ones for uh, $0.69. Cents, um, at, that's at Walmart, but you can get um, the, the Swanson ones at Safeway or any grocery store, um, have those. Our goal for this year is going to be 200 packets. Um, so you can start bringing those in any time. You can go online at Walmart and order a little case of them. Okay, so you can go on, in case for those of you who didn't hear, you can go on Walmart uh, and order and buy the case if you or like. Or Amazon. Or Amazon. So um, anyway, that's, that's our goal uh, for that. And we will be working towards both of these things, the shoe boxes. Uh, at least the, the stage will be a little less crowded this year because we won't have 100 cans <laughs> of uh, vegetables up here uh, and all the shoe boxes. So, um, but we will be working towards that. All right, we got another movie night coming up. We're gonna try it on a Sunday night this time. Uh, so the 20th, uh, we're gonna be uh, watching another movie. So come on uh, down, have some popcorn, bring your favorite snack to share, uh, and just uh, have a lot of fun 
enjoying uh, a, a movie. Um, I, I'm still deciding between a couple movies. Uh, I think that right now I'm looking at uh, Overcomer. Um, that might be the movie that we that we watch. So, so that'll be on the twentieth. And then, I don't know if you can smell it in the air. It's it's not the fall. It is potluck being cooked. Uh, and they're being warmed in the oven. So uh, we have a, a, a potluck. Uh, we want everybody to stay and, and have a, a, a good time have sharing a meal today uh, together. Um, I know that it smells really, really good. Um, I took a minute to go into the kitchen to pray before church service started, and it was like, uh, am I praying or am I just smelling all this stuff? Um, so I had to really concentrate on my prayer, uh, but it smells really good. So you guys come and, and enjoy that after service today. Is that it? Yes. Okay. So we always have a lot of announcements this time of year, um, and it probably won't be getting any less uh, announcements. But we are we're going to be looking at uh, Psalms uh, chapter 5 today, verses 1 through 8. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Heed the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells within you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. But as for me, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your holy temple, I will bow down in reverence to you. O oh Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us this morning, Lord, as we begin our service. We ask that you uh, touch our hearts, that you open up our hearts and our minds, Lord, so that we can feel your presence and hear you speak to us this morning. Uh, Lord, the, our only reason of being here is to worship you, Lord. So, Lord, we want to do that with everything that we are this morning. So, at this time, Lord, we just ask that you are our honored guest, and that you come and, and that you sit, that we may bow down before you this morning. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Sue, are you up to it? Something called cancer brain where you're a little spacier than normal but that's old age as well and uh, <laughs> we're a little late because I burnt the pizza I was bringing here today <laughs> so <laughs> I wouldn't bring anything but I knew there was plenty of food here <laughs> um, does anybody have prayer requests I'd like to request I'd like to request prayer for my uh, brother-in-law Craig um, he's had um, prostate cancer for a while now I actually wasn't aware that that was diagnosed but my sister was talking to me about it when I was walking the dog with her yesterday and um, it's her husband and so her name's Patty and um, the the reason I'm asking prayer is now I First of all, now I know that he has actually been diagnosed with the cancer, but it had been okay because his PSA had been uh, below threshold, but um, what happened was he had quite a lot of red, uh, of bright red blood in his urine recently. He did mention it to my sister, but he's not moving on uh, seeking it out with his doctor, so he's just keeping it between him and her now and it's really uh, disturbing her she doesn't want to push him but he needs to do that so that's my prayer request this morning I'd like to ask for our daughter Rachel and her family and God knows what each of them needs 
and um, continue prayer for my mom. She's making a big strides. She's going home Monday. Uh, I have a couple brothers who will be there for a couple of weeks, and they're going to assess whether she's actually able to stay at home. So I just pray for God's continued guidance in that situation. Oh, Lord, thank you for bringing us together in prayer. Thank you for this group of people and this building that allow us to remind ourselves and praise you every week and keep holy the Sabbath. So my prayers are for my kids and grandkids. Their family is going through a difficult time right now, a very difficult time. And I think that uh, conviction and conversion really needs to happen uh, with the parents and uh, at least one side of the grandparents. My sister Linda is ill. Um, you all know about Linda and she has a uh, really bad lung problem and is, um, she thinks that she doesn't have lung. Uh, and then um, for all the victims of Hurricane Helene, especially in Asheville, uh, North Carolina, they're, they've just been flooded and um, they haven't gotten much help from FEMA. So prayers that um, whoever is, whatever help they need is comes their way. And some people are still missing, so Lord, we pray that you find them and that you find them safe and return them to their loved ones. And um, then also, Father, we have a friend, Jesse Urban, um, his dad um, ended up in the ICU. He's a very good friend. They're very good Christians. They're friends from Florida, and he is now in hospice. So prayers that um, hospice is a good place for him, um, or and that for healing, if, if that's what he wants. And um, prayers, prayers for Cynthia. She's not here today, and um, I know she always wants us to pray for her friends. So let's pray for Cynthia's friends, Cynthia and Cynthia's friends. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Okay, let's go to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of coming right into your throne room, Lord Jesus. And it's through your blood, Lord Jesus, that you open that access. And we are eternally grateful, Lord Jesus. And we don't take it lightly that we can stand right before you. Lord, we bring Bob's brother-in-law, Craig, to you, Lord God, that uh, firstly, Lord, I ask for a divine touch that he would be miraculously healed of this cancer. And then tell them, Lord, that he would take the right steps he needs to take to get the medical help that he needs. And I pray for his wife, Patty, Lord, that you would give her peace in the midst of this trial. You give her comfort and wisdom and even joy, Lord Jesus. We lift up uh, Rachel and her family, Lord Jesus. You know exactly what their needs are right now. We pray that they have divine encounter with you and that you touch them, lead them, guide them, comfort them. And for Emily's mom, we thank you for her healing. We ask that you give her strength and you give them all wisdom and guidance as far as her future and whether she can live alone or not. Lord, and we lift up Jen's kids to you, Lord and grandkids. We do ask for um, conviction of the Holy Ghost and conversion, Lord God. They all come to know your salvation, that they have a divine encounter with you, Jesus, in your glory. You touch them. And your sister who's ill, Lord Jesus, you know what she needs exactly. We ask for a divine touch from you, Jesus, whether it's a healing right now or the complete healing in eternity. 
surround her with your grace and mercy and comfort the whole family as they're going through this, Lord Jesus. And Jesse's dad in ICU, Lord God, you can heal him right now, Lord Jesus. Touch him. Let this be a very holy time for the family. Draw them closer to you through this. Lord, and uh, I'd already written North Carolina down, Lord, and Florida, too, as this new hurricane's about to hit an already devastated area. Lord God, I'm, I've been overwhelmed, as many have, just looking at the reports out in North Carolina, the hundreds and hundreds that are actually dead that they're finding as they get back into these communities, Lord Jesus. And the um, search and rescue is now becoming search and recovery. And that it's such a hard blow what's happened to all these people. And it's years it's going to take to recover from this. And some won't. And I just pray for a miraculous move of God in this region. I thank you for the thousands and probably millions of Christians that have responded when FEMA wasn't even there to help. Christians began showing up and providing. I thank you for all those nurses and doctors going in by mule to help these people and just the um, how neighbors are helping neighbors. And it just makes me so much more aware that we need to be prepared for any big disaster, Lord. And we need to be prepared not only to help ourselves, but to help our neighbors. And uh, just show us what that would mean for this church. Lord, I know that water is the biggest issue people had right away. They had no clean water for days. And just show us that that's something we need to do. Just lead us and direct us how we can be a help to others and prepared. But I do ask that you pour out your amazing grace in these regions, Lord, parts of Tennessee that are so ravaged by this last hurricane. And I ask that you supernaturally touch the body of Christ, that they're able to lay hands on the, the dead even and raise them up, that they are able to lay hands on the ill and they'll be healed, that they're able to pray over a pot of soup and it gets increased to feed a thousand. Lord, you're able to do these things. I've seen you do these things. I know you can do that for the body of Christ in that region. I thank you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we lift up Cynthia, Lord God, and her friends. She has a, such a heart for all her friends that need a touch from you. And you know her list, Lord God. And we do lift up the homeless of Burnville and ask that you touch them and meet their needs. And I thank you what you're doing in this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So why don't we sing this song together, declaring the Lordship of Jesus Christ as we crown him with many crowns.
versions of that hymn uh, with the same tune, and we had the lyrics for one, and he played the other one. So. Oh, really? Oh, I'm sorry. But you sounded <laughs> nice. Okay. Right. Hey, we were with you. Yeah. Okay. In spirit, not just doing our voices. <laughs>
testimonies. We can look back on our lives and see the faithfulness of our God in times when we didn't see a way through he made a way and he continues to do that in our lives. So we just want to lay our crowns before you this morning Lord Jesus and declare you as our Lord and Savior. As we fall down Oh, 
we set aside for our uh, communion time, first Sunday of the month. We figure we get a, a good meal afterwards. We want to share a meal with Jesus beforehand. Uh, so we're going to do them even different than we have been doing today. I want to read the scripture, uh, and then we're going to pass out the, uh, the uh, elements of the, the communion, and then we're going to watch a video. And when you feel uh, that you are ready to, um, to take it, you go ahead and take it on your own. But let me read to you what uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord is that the Lord in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in the remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if I could have a couple people come up and pass out the communion. changed my mind on Vicky and I'm changing my mind again. I want, I want to read you a little something before before we take it. Um, I hope you guys don't mind then changing on the fly because I just I was sitting there and I'm, I'm going, I need to read what God gave me this week. I want you to bow your heads because I want this to be a time where you're concentrating on your relationship with Jesus and not anything else that's going on. So as we begin, uh, ask the Lord to reveal if there's any unrepentant sin in your life, any unconfessed sin. And if he brings it to your mind, repent of it right away and confess it to him. And remember, repenting just doesn't mean you're sorry. Repenting, it means you're turning away from it. 180 degrees. 
Then ask the Lord to cover you with his blood and fill you anew and afresh with his spirit. And then focus your mind on Jesus. Imagine that you're in a courtroom. You've been found guilty of all your sins and condemned to death. And as they come to take you to your fate, the judge suddenly stops the proceedings. He looks at you and he tells you that he loves you so much that he's come up with a way of paying for your sins without you having to suffer death. And from behind him steps his son. The son has, that has never sinned, never broken the law, and is perfect. The judge tells you he's going to let his own son take your punishment for you. You suddenly find it hard to breathe. You were headed for death, a just punishment for your sins. Now the judge is giving his own son to take your punishment to die in your place. And as they begin to take the son away, you stop them. And you look at Jesus and you ask him why. Look into his eyes as Jesus tells you that the Father and he love you so much that he willingly takes your place. And as you look into Jesus' eyes, you can see the depth of his love and it's reflected in his Father's eyes as well. Look at him and thank him for dying in your place. Thank him for forgiving your sins. And then renew your commitment to following him. And finally, thank him for his sacrifice that saved you from death and gave you eternal life with him. And then once you're ready, take the juice and the bread and, and take it um, as you see fit. still involved in this with, with God, just go ahead and keep doing it. Pay no attention to me. But we're starting a series this morning called It's All About Jesus. And today's message is called Who Do You Say That I Am? The name Jesus. There is no other name in heaven or on earth that is more loved, more revered, or more controversial than Jesus. At first glance, Jesus' resume is rather simple. He's never tra traveled more than a few hundred miles from his hometown. He never wrote a book, never held a political office, never married, never went to college, never visited a big city, and never even attended a comic book convention. Despite all of that, Jesus stands alone in all of history the single most significant person who ever lived. But who is Jesus, really? See, there are a lot of interpretations of Jesus out there. A cartoon version of Jesus has made several appearances on the long-running TV show shows like The Simpsons and South Park. Celebrities like Aston Kutcher, Ben Affleck, and Brad Pitt have been spotted wearing Jesus is my homeboy t-shirts. And in the movie Talladega Nights, the ballad of Ricky Bobby, comedian Will Ferrell, leads his family in prayer to an eight-pound, six-ounce newborn infant Jesus wearing a golden fleece diaper and watching uh, developmental videos about shapes and colors. Apparently, he liked the Christmas Jesus the best. There was even a bizarre Canadian kung fu comedy horror musical about the second call, coming called Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter, which pairs Jesus with Mexican wrestling hero El Salantos and a battle an army of, and they battle an army of vampires together. Bumper stickers all over the country proclaim that Jesus is my co-pilot, and you can even buy a uh, Buddy Christ bobblehead figure 
winking and shooting you a thumbs up. Jesus, it seems, is everywhere. And everyone seems to have an opinion about him. And Jesus wants to ask his disciples, who do people say the, the Son of Man is? And they gave a variety of answers. And they still do that today. In fact, in fact uh, Bluefish TV looked, uh, took to the streets and asking bystanders the question, who is Jesus? Listen to some of their answers. and he became this like prophet for eventually what would become Christianity and then at the age of 32 he died on the cross and it's like three days later he was resurrected oh, well, you know, Jesus, I believe that religion was just created to control the masses really Jesus is the, our Lord and Savior that died on the cross for us for our sins Jesus is a uh, person that existed that continues to enrich the lives of people every day. Jesus is God's son and he was sent to save our sins. I think he is a pretty cool guy. He had a, a peaceful philosophy. I think he's misinterpreted by a lot of people. He's the savior of this world. I don't know, I don't really believe in him, so I don't really think anything of him. I, I mean, he could have been a real person. I mean, I'm sure he was. I mean, I'm sure he was just, you know, good at what he did or something. I feel that Jesus is a modern-day scapegoat. Jesus is God, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just learned that. Uh, Jesus was a man, from what I figure. Who is Jesus? He was a dude, lived back in the day. Pretty awesome. He had a beard. He was just kind of a guy with a really unique, positive message as that kind of gave a lot of people a lot of hope. He probably existed, but I don't believe that he was the son of God. Mm -hmm. He died on the cross for us and uh, saved us and rose again from the dead. That one didn't sound smart, but... <laughs> there are so many conflicting opinions about Jesus, and the truth is, how we see Jesus affects everything. And in his book, The Jesus You Can't Ignore, Pastor John Mac uh, MacArthur writes, what you think of Jesus will thoroughly color how you think about everything else. Our view of Jesus affects our view of God, the world, ourselves, and every one of our decisions. So who is Jesus really? How should we see him? Well, we're going to begin a five-week uh, series on the book of Colossians and looking at what Paul wrote about who Jesus really is. Well, the church in Colossae wrestled with the question about who Jesus was when Paul wrote this letter to that church. Some very sketchy beliefs had gotten into the church there and they had threatened to uh, cripple it from within. This false teaching was a deceptive combination of Jewish legalism, Eastern philosophy, pagan astrology, mysticism, and self-denial. There was something for everybody and that's what made it so dangerous. By mixing their Christianity with all these various religions and philo philosophical worldviews, the Colossians had lost sight of who Jesus really was. They forgot about who it's really all about. So Paul writes this letter to set them straight, and he begins by setting the record straight about Jesus. Most scholars believe that this section of scripture, because of how poetic it is put together, may have been an ancient creed or maybe even the lyrics to an early Christian hymn. But whatever its source, it's all about Jesus. And this is what Colossians 1, 15-22 says. Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. He is the firstborn Son, superior to all created things. For through Him God created everything in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen things, including spiritual powers, lords, rulers, and authorities. God created the whole universe through Him and for Him. Christ existed before all things, and in union with him all things have their proper place. He is the head of his body, the church. He is the source of the body's life. He is the firstborn son who was raised from death in order that he alone might have the first place in all things. For it was by God's own decision that the son has, has in himself the full measure of God. Through the son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. 
God made peace through his son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. At one time you were far away from God and were his enemies because of the evil things you did and thought. But now, by means of the physical death of his son, God has made you his friends in order to bring you holy, pure, and faultless into his presence. See, now Paul could have started off by attacking the Colossians' incorrect beliefs uh, or uh, immoral behaviors. But instead he starts by saying, hey, let's talk about Jesus. Because it's all about Jesus in reality. And if you get Jesus right in your life and, and in the life of our church, then everything else is going to fall into place. And we're going to look at three characteristics of Jesus as Paul describes him in these verses. And the first is, Jesus is our creator. Paul declares that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. The visible image of the invisible God. He, he writes in verses 15 and 16, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realm and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Have you ever thought about that? That everything that can be seen was created through Jesus. Take a minute just to think about that. Astronomers estimate that the diameter of the observable universe is about 93 billion light years. And it contains over 100 billion galaxies. Each, and each galaxy containing hundreds of billions of stars. And nearly every star has one or more planets revolving around it. I don't know about you, but that just blows my mind. Jesus says, made all, uh, Jesus, Paul says, made all things seen and unseen. He made it all. Let me just switch gears for a minute and think about uh, the detailed complexity of the other side of creation. Do you know that a caterpillar has 228 separate muscles in its head? That's crazy. The average elm tree has approximately 6 million leaves on it. Your own heart generates enough pressure that it could squirt blood up to 30 feet. I don't recommend testing that, but have, have you ever thought about how a creative and incredible Jesus is? See, he didn't have to make hundreds of different kinds of bananas, but he did. He didn't have to put 3,000 species of trees within one square mile in the Amazon, uh, but he did. He doesn't, didn't have to create us, but he did. And everything about us is unique. Our fingerprints, our heartbeat, our DNA, even our laugh. Have you ever met anyone who laughs exactly the same way as you do? But whatever Jesus' reason for such diversity, creative creativity, and sophistication in the, in the universe and on earth and in us, the point of it all is to his glory. Jesus' creation speaks of himself, reflecting who he is and what he's like. His art, his handiwork, his creation all echo the truth that he is glorious. There is no one like him. And that's why Paul writes, he is supreme over all creation in verse 15. This is the Christ of Christianity. So first of all, Jesus is our creator. Paul goes on to say that Jesus is our commander. In August 1994, a Korean airjet skidded across a rain-soaked runway and rammed a safety barricade while landing. Thankfully, all 160 passengers escaped safely just moments before the plane exploded into flames. What was the cause of the accident? Well, according to news reports, the pilot and the co-pilot had gotten into a fistfight over who was in charge of handling the landing controls. You think that they would have covered that in the flight manual somewhere. But there's just something in our human nature that makes us want to be the ones in charge. I, I don't know if you've experienced that or not. In the church, though, we're not the ones in charge. Jesus is in charge. Paul puts it this way in verse 18. He is the head of the body. The body is the church. 
Everything comes from him, and he is the first one who was raised from, from death. So in all things, Jesus is the most important. What does it mean that Jesus is the head of the church? It means he's the boss. Jesus is in charge, and what he says goes. He calls all the shots. He has all the authority. He is our commander-in-chief. In fact, Paul writes in Ephesians 1, verses 21 through 23, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who, who fills all things everywhere with himself. See, Jesus is in charge of this church. This is his church. I'm not the head of the church. Board members are not the head of the church. And the Pope isn't the head of the church. Jesus and Jesus alone is the head of the church. And we follow his leadership and his teaching. If I were to put an organizational chart up on, on the, uh, the PowerPoint here showing who's responsible for what ministries in this church, right at the top would be the name Jesus Christ. The problem with that is, just like those Korean pilots, we like to be the ones in charge. We like to call the shots. And in many churches, people throw their weight around when an important decision needs to be made. And then they grumble and complain when things don't go their way. Listen, if Jesus really is supreme over all creation, if he's powerful enough to speak the cosmos into existence, and brilliant enough to fashion together the trillions of cells that make up every detail of who we are, then the smartest thing that we can do is to follow his leadership, to surrender to Jesus' authority, both in our personal lives and in the lives of this church. An African convert, while visiting a school where girls were learning to sew, noticed a simple principle. Wherever the, the needle went, the thread followed. Seems like a perfectly logical thing. But that, he decided, should represent his relationship with Jesus. He prayed, O oh Lord, you are the needle and I am the thread. Wherever Christ led, he would follow. The same should be true in our lives and our relationships with Jesus. First, Jesus is our creator. Furthermore, he's our commander. Finally, Jesus is our conciliator. A conciliator is someone who assists reconciliation, a peacemaker or a mediator. Maybe you know someone who has a broken relationship with someone. Maybe you know what it's like to be alienated, separated, or estranged from someone, someone that you were once close with. Maybe it's a father and son, or a mother and daughter, siblings, or just two close friends. They get into a fight or an argument, and things are said that can never be unsaid. Feelings are hurt, and the good relationship they once enjoyed is strained to the breaking point. They stop talking to each other and they just drift further and further apart. According to Paul, that's what happened between us and God. And it was our fault. He writes in verse 21, This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. We've broken our relationship with God time and time again. We sin. We hurt God terribly with our disobedience and our rebellion. God doesn't have to forgive us. In fact, he could just as easily hold a grudge and banish us for eternity. Instead, God chose reconciliation. Paul continued in verse 22, But now, by means of the physical death of his son, God has made you his friends in order to bring you holy, pure, and faultless into his presence. This is the gospel, people. The good news for you, for me, and for everyone. Our faults, our failures, and our weaknesses drove a wedge between us and God so much that he saw us as his enemies. But in spite of all of our sins and our shortcomings, God still loved us and wanted a relationship with us that would last into eternity. So God became a man and visited this tiny blue planet in this vast universe that he created. As the God-man, Jesus lived the perfect, sinless life that we could never do. And he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. The old rugged cross was tinged red with the blood of the creator of the cosmos. And through his sacrifice, Jesus reconnected us with God. 
He allows us to know God personally and to spend all eternity in his glorious presence. God comes to us through his son, Jesus Christ, embracing us, calling us brother and sister, and saying, I forgive you. I don't hold your sins against you. I want to walk with you and be your friend. Jesus makes that possible. So as Paul looked and saw the doctrinal dysfunction going on in Colossae, he knew that the place to start was Jesus, because it's all about Jesus. If they could get on the right page when it came to Jesus, then they could get back on track. So who is Jesus? First, he's our creator. All things were created by him and for him. Further, he's our commander. He is head of the church, which is his body. Finally, he's our conciliator. Through him, we are reconciled to God. The question now is, once we know who Jesus is and the place he holds in the universe, the church, and in our own lives, how does that change things? How does that affect our actions, our attitudes, our relationships, and, and even more? And we will explore those questions as we continue through the book of Colossians over the next few weeks. But in the meantime, if you're ready to put your faith and hope in, in Christ alone, then I want to invite you to come talk with me. So you can do that as we sing our final song in just a few minutes. And I'm going to be standing up by the piano as we sing. And if you want to talk, come and talk to me. Now you can catch me after the service as people are preparing for the potluck. You can get in touch with me this week through email, phone call, or a message. But more importantly than talking with me, talk to Jesus. Maybe you just need to pray. Stand there and pray as we sing. Acknowledge Jesus as the creator, the commander. Then ask him to be your conciliator. Then you can stand before uh, God clothed in Jesus' goodness and glory. And if you are already a child of God, but you need to put him back into your life as creator, commander, and conciliator, I want to encourage you to do that this morning as well. If you need prayer that you didn't share this morning, or need to talk or pray with someone as you work uh, to put one of those three things into your life in the proper place, then you can use this time for that as well. But whatever God has put on your heart this morning, respond as he leads. May God have his, his way in each of our hearts and lives this morning. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that these words, Lord, that, that you have sent us, Lord, reaches into our hearts. Lord, that you allow the Holy Spirit free access to us right now, Lord. And if there are parts of our lives, Lord, that we have taken over the commanding spot, Lord, we pray right now that you give us the, uh, um, the will to let go of that and make Jesus the supreme commander. And Lord, if there is somebody in this building or somebody that is watching online right now, Lord, that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that you press upon their heart right now the, the need for that to happen. Lord, we say it's all about Jesus. And we can say that all we want, Lord, but it really comes down to what we do with that knowledge. If Jesus is really everything, and it's, our lives are all about Jesus, then, Lord, we need to acknowledge you as Lord. So, Lord, whatever you need to do this morning, Lord, we give you free reign to do. And we pray this in your name. Amen.
Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Amen. <laughs> 